Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Myth Masters, a conversation with Holly Black, Kate Elliott, and Barry Liga. I'm Eileen Cooper, Bookless Books for Youth Senior Editor. I hope it's warm where you are. It's probably not, so this webinar will be a wonderful way to escape. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. To resize the slides or fit them to your screen, Look to the magnifying glass icon located in the upper right of the slides. Clicking that button will display a drop-down menu with several options where you can select the way in which you'd like the slides to appear. If you lose audio or would like to change the way you're connected to it, look under the participants box to the right of your screen and click on the phone question mark icon. If you experience any issues during the webinar, Click on the FAQ Webinars tab in the upper left-hand corner of your WebEx screen to view a PDF with answers commonly asked webinar questions. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the right side of your screen is a control panel with an area at the bottom for Q&A. <laughs> Simply type your <clears throat> excuse me, questions into the field and click Send. Attendees can see all the questions asked during the webinar and the answers provided. If time allows, at the end of our presentations, we may address some of the questions with our panelists. A list of the titles discussed during today's presentation can be downloaded at any time by going to the URL on your screen. You'll have access to this URL later if you can't write it down now. Today, we are going to hear from three of modern science fiction and fantasy's most prestigious authors, Holly Black, Kate Elliott, and Barry Liga. Joining us also is Victoria Stapleton. Victoria, who will be moderating our panel, is the, is the Director of School and Library Marketing at Little Brown Books for Young Readers, which she thinks may be the best job in all of publishing anywhere. And now, I'm going to pass it on to Victoria. Well, hello everyone and welcome. Um, I am extremely disturbed by the photo of myself that I'm looking at, so uh, forgive me if I get a slightly discombobulated. Of course, I can't become too discombobulated because I am in New York where I think we might be almost the coldest place on Earth, unless, of course, that is the Boston area where one of our panelists is joining us from today. I'm so pleased that you'll be with us today to discuss uh, Myth Masters with Holly, Kate, and Barry. When I started thinking about this uh, program, I come from a ba an academic background where I spent quite a bit of time reading myth and discussing myth and, and pondering the modern impact of myth. I was doing a PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies prior to my modern life as a person in children's publishing. So Kate, Barry, and Holly's books have, have provided a bridge to me, for me, to that past life. And when I started thinking about their most recent books, I again started pondering myth. Myth is a word we think of today as a lie or an untrue story. In fact, myth in the ancient world referred to a story that expressed a culture or society's most deeply held values and imparted to people extremely important information that integrated them, in, uh, integrated the people hearing the story into the community and helped them become part of that society. And so I wondered, with these authors, Holly, Kate, and Barry working with such deep and interesting themes, how would they discuss working with core values in their narratives and drawing on ancient long known or maybe not long known themes and motifs in presenting their work for young adults today? And we're pleased to start with Holly Black, who is the Newbery Honor winner for Doll Bones and one of the great acclaimed uh, Y authors of the 21st century. Um, she is known for Tithe, um, really her first YA that is nearest and dearest to my heart always. I press it to my bosom yearly. Uh, the um, pen, the uh, Spiderwick Chronicles, 
the coldest girl in Cold Town, oh so good, and most recently, the darkest part of the forest. Holly, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Victoria. Um, it's fun actually to, it's fun to be back um, working with fairies. Um, again, you know, um, a lot of my first works were about fairy folklore and, um, you know, drew on fairy folklore heavily. And so it's really fun to get to use that again. And, um, you know, I don't actually do a lot of work with myth. You know, as Victoria was saying, myth, you know, myths are the big stories. They're about gods and kings and, you know, why the stars shine. There are sacred stories. They're sort of epic high concept stuff. Um, and folklore is really, a, you know, a lot about the little stories, the stories about uh, regular people brushing up against the supernatural and coming away from it, sometimes worse, sometimes better, sometimes actually totally unchanged. Um, often it's just a weird thing that happened to some guy one time. Uh, and a lot of fairy folklore falls, you know, falls into that category of just this really, these really odd moments. Um, and there's something really amazing about that. There's something about the idea that magic is out there, that it's just around the corner, that it's something we can glimpse if we pay enough attention, or that we might knock into if we don't pay enough attention. You know, um, we can stumble right into it. Um, and the thing that I really love about fairies is how, unlike a lot of other supernatural creatures, they're not like us, and they were never like us. You know, um, werewolves are us changed. You know, vampires are us, dead and risen, um, but fairies exist completely apart from us. And, you know, they're alien creatures and they have alien taboos and mores and we can offend them without meaning to. As in the case of the first story that I'm going to tell you. It's kind of a two-part story, It's one of my favorites. So there's this guy, his name is Mickey Langan and he is in Ireland. He has picked out a spot uh, where he wants to build a house. It's, it's, um, it's up on a hill. It's got a small stream nearby. There's a bunch of, there's a couple of fairy forts nearby, but he's not in a direct path to, to any of them, you know, places where people believe the fairies lived. They call them fairy forts. Um, and so he thinks this, this looks like a pretty good spot. Uh, and so he, he sets out to build, and his wife says, you know, you really should consult the local wise woman. Like, before we build, make sure that this is okay. And he's like, whatever, and he starts to build. And then his neighbors come by one by one. You know you should really maybe consult with the local wise woman. And he's like, Ugh, come on. And then finally his wife comes back, and she's weeping, and she's like, please consult with the local wise woman. So, um, so he does, he, he, he finally, um, he goes out and he, he talks to her and all she says is, not here, Mickey, not here. Well, okay, flash forward, um, new guy, his name is Patty Bain and he doesn't care about anything. He picks out a spot, he's, he's getting married and he wants to build a house for his, he and his new wife, her name is Biddy Callen. And um, so he, Picks out a stretch of land, coincidentally the same stretch of land that Mickey was dissuaded from, from building on. And um, so he builds his house. And uh, he and Biddy Callen move into it. And it seems like a nice house. Everything is going fine. There are a couple small disturbances. But then one full moon night, there's this sound like a train going past his house. And the house is shaking. And he feels like it's going to come, come apart. There are... Um, Pots and pans banging into one another. Um, Big Callan is screaming, and uh, and but they they stay in the house and they they sit there and they wait until morning. And when morning comes, they realize you know no one else has heard this disturbance. So belatedly, he follows the path of uh, Mickey Langan and consults with the local wise woman. He comes out and says, "Well, I have good news and bad news for you." Um, the bad news is you built your house on a fairy path, and fairies, they, they don't like to go around things. The good news is you only built a corner of your house on a fairy path. And so, you know, and so um, Patty goes out, and he's like, well, okay, fine, and he cuts off the corner of his house. And um, Victoria, I think we actually have a picture of his house. Let's look. Oh, there it is. You can sort of see, he cut off the corner. And um, 
And so they move back in and, and all goes well. And um, except sometimes on full moon nights when there is a sound like a wind, like a, a very strong wind going past, and then it takes the corner. And that is exactly what I love about Mary's stories because Patty's fine. He and Biddy Callan, they go on about their days. You know, everything goes pretty smoothly, but they have this one moment of sort of rubbing up against the supernatural. Um, you know, and one of the things that whenever we talk about these kinds of stories, people ask is, is this real? Is this true? And I mean, we, and we have no way of knowing, but we know that Mickey believed it enough not to build, that his neighbors believed it enough to urge him to consult a wise woman. We know that Patty believed it enough to cut off the corner of his house, and we can actually see his house as proof of how much he believed it. Um, so the second story I want to tell you um, is a little bit more of a true crime story. Um, it's a story of a woman by the name of Bridget Cleary, who was murdered by her husband, Michael Cleary, because he believed you know, that she was a fairy changeling. It happened in 1895, which sounds like a long time ago, but in a lot of ways really isn't a long time ago. My great-grandmother, who I knew, would have been alive then. Um, and so, it, to me, it is inconceivable that such a short time ago, something like this could have happened. Um, so Bridget was 26. Her husband, Michael, was nine years older than her. They had no children. And um, Bridget had a level of independence that most women in that place and time would not have because she had a, an egg delivery business. And so she would often take long walks and um, she would go past the sort of the local fairy forts you know, places that people believed maybe you shouldn't actually go. And she was cautioned by several members of her family not to go there. But she, you know, she believed this was a faster way of delivering eggs and, and, and went through. Um, and then at some point she became ill and she stayed ill for a couple of days. And um, some of her relatives thought she looked much changed and her neighbors and relatives and Michael began to interrogate her about whether or not she was a changeling, asking her over and over and over again to admit it, trying various folk remedies, many of them disgusting. And after that, she goes missing. And for a lot of people, they assumed that she had gone away with the fairies until they found her burned body and, you know, realized that, you know, something truly terrible had happened. Um, and again, the question is, right, is it real? Is it true? You know, did Michael really believe that his wife Bridget was a changeling? Or was he just looking for an excuse to kill his wife? And, and we have no idea. Um, but we know that he never admitted to her murder. He only said he was going to destroy the changeling. And we know that there were people in the room with him who cared about her an enormous amount. Um, but nonetheless, let the situation get so out of control that she died. Um, her own father said that he believed that Bridget would come riding back on a white horse the next morning. And when she didn't, that was when he started to panic. Um, Michael's defense did not fly, and um, he was convicted along with several other people and actually set a legal precedent that no longer was it possible for, um, for a victim being a witch or fairy to be used <laughs> I mean, as an excuse for any crime. Um, and then Michael emigrated to Montreal. Um, so for me, one of the things I really wanted to do with uh, Darkest Part of the Forest was get at some of the weirdness and anxiety and horror of what it would be like to live in a town like Fairfold, um, the town I made up where everyone believes in fairies, um, where there's this sleeping horn of fairy prince out in the woods that, you know, kids sort of sneak out and party around and that everyone, you know, acknowledges and is aware of. Um, you know, we are anxious when we believe fairies are real. We, um, we do not necessarily um, only, you know, are only delighted, we are actually you know, made quite anxious. And also, I wanted to talk about the power of stories and how we're defined by stories. Um, Hazel and Ben and brother and sister growing up in Fairfield have told so many stories about the sleeping prince that they feel like they know him, although of course they don't. And that power of the stories they've told themselves about one another and about themselves and the, the way that they're trapped in stories. Um, you know, we don't always choose what story we're in. Bridget, I'm sure, thought she was in one story until she was abruptly in another.
Okay, thank you. I love the idea of brushing or rubbing up against the supernatural. And I think that's something that you, what you refer to as folklore shares in common with myth. It's a way of almost geographically orienting ourselves to what is human space and what's our appropriate place in the world. I think that's fascinating. Now I'm so, I'm sorry, I'm a, I may get a little um, incoherent in my excitement at welcoming Kate Elliott. Uh, Kate is an acclaimed fantasy author who has written a number of extremely good, uh, verging on superior and excellent fantasy novels, including a trilogy for Orbit, which is called the Spirit Walker Trilogy. And I'm just going to forward to that slide just for a moment, if I can figure out how to work my machine right now. Um, I fell in love with these books, and I confess that I have read them more than once because they they are adventurous and interesting, and they feature a female character who is who is uh, uh, um, fairly amazing and an equally strong and mysterious male character as well. She will arrive on the LBYR list this spring with her book Court of Five, um, which we kind of think about Little Women meets Game of Thrones, but that might not be. Um, accurate. It might be too small a description for what goes on here. Kate Elliott, welcome. And please share with us how you have been using ancient tropes in your modern fiction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. And I'm coming through okay? Oh, you absolutely are. All the way from warm Hawaii, everybody be jealous. I, I'm not going to tell you that it's cold here for today, uh, so I won't. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I, You know, I want to and, and I loved hearing what Holly had to say, and it kind of fits actually together with what I'm going to say in a, in a kind of totally different way. So uh, I want to talk today about that sense of a myth being a story of who we are and, and especially how we understand how the world works. You know, history and myth-making get intertwined because history is tricky. You know, we have facts like George Washington was the first president of the United States. But not everything gets remembered and written down. And even if it is written down, and if in, and written down in the past, it doesn't necessarily get passed down to us as common knowledge. So facts and events can get discarded as unimportant, or they get discarded because they don't fit the story people think is realistic. So for instance, I, in college, a guy once said to me, oh, you know, there were no women composers before the 20th century. It, he believed that because at the time he was in school, this was like a long time ago, it, none were mentioned in the music history he was taught, but of course there were women composers. So sometimes the history that we think we know has become a form of myth-making. And in this context, I want to talk briefly about Cleopatra, who is possibly the most famous woman in history, and how the story of Cleopatra influenced Court of Fives. Um, even though the novel isn't about her and isn't really inspired by her life. The Court of Fives, Court of, excuse me, the dogs, if you hear little feet, that's the dog. Uh, Court of Fives is inspired by Little Women, by epic fantasy, um, by my wanting to write a story about a girl who's an athlete. This is kind of my love letter to um, sports. And by my husband's work at an archaeological site in Egypt, which dates from the Greco-Roman period. So I'm going to give a really quick history. When Alexander the Great died in 323 before the Common Era, he left an empire that stretched from Greece to India. What he did not leave was a strong adult male heir. So his generals fought over his empire for 30 years, and I could go on for hours about how what a, it's an incredible story, and most of them are awful, but I, but I won't. One of those generals was a man named Ptolemy, and he was really, really smart. He went to Egypt, which was over to one side, out of the way. So all the fighting went on in the other parts of the, you know, the empire. And furthermore, Egypt was rich at that time. They had grain, they had vineyards, they had mines. And he founded what's called the Ptolemaic dynasty after him. Um, it's also called the Ptolemaic dynasty because all the kings after him were named Ptolemy, except for the two who were named Ptolemy Alexander. Um, and our Cleopatra is actually Cleopatra the seventh. She's the seventh Cleopatra to have been queen in the Ptolemaic dynasty. 
she was also the last ruler of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which lasted almost 300 years. After she died, Rome made Egypt into a province. Um, and she was not only the last ruler of the Ptolemaic dynasty, but because the Ptolemies came into Egypt as outsiders, they were Macedonians, they were also careful to style themselves as pharaohs in the Egyptian tradition. So Cleopatra is, I believe, also the last pharaoh of Egypt. And she styled herself as pharaoh, not as, not as queen pharaoh, but as pharaoh. That was a title that wasn't gendered. Um, so I can tell you the three main things that I learned about Cleopatra when I was young. First of all, she's the historical epitome of the exotic, erotic seductress. She uses her sexy, feminine wiles, right, to seduce these two different powerful Roman men, Julius Caesar and then Mark Antony, because obviously she needs a powerful man's support to hold on to power. Um, second, of course, we all, when, when it all fails, because that's what happens when ambitious women grasp for power, she kills herself with a, with a bite of a poisonous snake. But the third lesson I learned, and this is the myth-making part, um, is that it's about the story about what appropriate rulership is. So that story goes like this, that, you know, that the last Ptolemy was a woman is a sign of how the dynasty be had become degenerate. So only weak dynasties can ever be ruled by women. You know that a dynasty is on its last legs if all you have left is a woman to take power. So this isn't myth-making in that kind of deep cosmological sense, but it is myth-making in the sense of how we define ourselves and how we understand how the world should work and how the, how the world should properly work. Because the thing is, Cleopatra came from a tradition of powerful queens. She wasn't an anomaly. She wasn't the first ruling queen in the Ptolemaic dynasty. A number of her predecessors had co-ruled and ruled alone before her. And even in the larger Hellenistic world, which begins with the death of Alexander the Great and is generally ends with the, considered to end with Cleopatra's death, you see women playing prominent political roles and even in some cultures going to war with their armies. So she was, she, of course she was extraordinary, but in her time and place, she was not doing anything that was particularly unusual. You know, she, of course she made alliances with Rome, with or without the sex involved, because she was good at diplomacy and strategy, and because Rome was a threat to many, they, they swallowed up many independent kingdoms at this time. She spoke multiple languages. She could read and write as well as anyone. She had studied extensively at the famous Library of Alexandria. Uh, she was the first Ptolemy who spoke Egyptian, which was the language of the local, the local people. Um, she accompanied her fleet and her army, and she wasn't the first queen to do it. And I, I've actually seen a legal document, a slide of a legal document that may have her writing, her handwriting on it. And it basically the equivalent of, of you know, make it so or make it happen, just kind of written off to the one side of a, a legal document, which I, it's just like, to me, incredibly cool. Um, but what do we hear about Cleopatra? We hear that she used sex. You know, that's the woman's weapon. And so how does that relate? So in Court of Fives, uh, the main character is a girl named Jessamy. And I used Greco-Roman Egypt as a template for the fantasy world, although it's not a historical novel. Um, but in Aphaea, which is the country where Jess lives and where the story takes place, the rulers in the upper class are outsiders and the indigenous people are subjects. And as I was writing, I took to heart the story of Cleopatra. You know, people often say that history is written by the conquerors and that history has an agenda. And this is absolutely true of how the Romans wrote about Cleopatra. They knew how powerful she was and they, she scared them. Um, and it's certainly true of how later historians and, and storytellers turn her into this seductress queen and ignore all these other things about her. So it's that gap between myth and history that is part of what inspired me to write Court of Fives. And in, in my story, the history and religion of Jess's mother's people has literally been buried. And that's part of what the, the novel is about. And and. To, so to wrap up, this is something I really think novels can do so well. We can write history, we can reflect on how myth-making becomes intertwined with history, and in novels, it, 
novels are just such an effective way to bring overlooked and forgotten stories back into our consciousness. Um, so thank you. I love how you've talked about that, Kate, uh, because it does actually go back into myth as a cosmic force because we are, through those acts of historical myth-making, making a cosmos anew, That's remaking right. over the universe by deciding which things are facts and which things are beyond fact. And I love the idea of uncovering and exploring how, what we value in the facts that we preserve and how we arrange them. I hope we come back to that in our discussion, in the discussion portion uh, of the webinar. Um, last but not least, uh, gentle listeners, is Barry Liga. Um, recently, um, or not so recently, I had the opportunity to attend Barry Liga's wedding. And I have to say this was one of the better events that I've ever uh, attended. I'm not a huge wedding attendee person, but I make an exception every once in a while. And what I loved about Barry's wedding was that it was mythic in itself as he recast himself as the groom, as Superman, by literally entering and walk at the facility and walking down the aisle to the Superman uh, fanfare. And who's to say that that was not legitimate? Uh, Barry is the author of a number of highly regarded YA books and for Little Brown Books for Young Readers, last year he concluded the I Hunt Killers trilogy um, with Blood of My Blood and I'm still afraid of the dark to be quite honest with you after having finished that really very tragic hopeful, frightening, uplifting, disturbing, comforting um, trilogy. He arrives next on our list this summer with After the Red Rain, which he has written in uh, along with Peter Facinelli and Robert DeFranco. Some of you may recognize the name Peter Facinelli from a certain um, vampire-themed uh, film trilogy, as well as the very fine television show uh, Nurse Jackie. Uh, Barry, there are many interesting ways in which the world is manipulated and the stories we tell ourselves to get through are treated here. What can you share with us on the theme of myth and story making? Well, as Victoria intimated, I guess I'm somewhat familiar with myth uh, given that I decided I was Superman at a young age. You know, I'm not, I realize that publicly and in my writing career, I'm not known for myths or for science fiction or for fantasy, but this actually is the stuff that drives me. This is the stuff I, I've cared about and been obsessed with since I was a kid. I used to read every book I could get my hands on about Greek or Roman or Norse mythology. Uh, so this, writing this book in a way feels like coming home to me. And before I start, I, I just wanna make sure I give due credit. This isn't just my book. Uh, my name is first, but the fact of the matter is Rob DeFranco was the one who literally dreamt up the idea and, uh, and approached Peter and then they came to me and said, look, we have this idea, we're not sure where it goes, we're not sure what the shape of it is, what do you think? And it, it sort of became my job to take the putty and the clay and figure out how to turn it into a book. And it was a, it was a really interesting process for me. When I talk today, I'm not speaking for Rob. I don't know exactly what he was thinking when he came up with this. I'm not sure if he was thinking of myth at all, but I know that I was thinking of myth as I was working on it. So I'm speaking for myself, but I do like to think that he would agree with me if I uh, hear what I was saying. You know, there are all sorts of different types of myth, obviously. Every pantheon has its own myths about everything from the very small to the very large. But one of the myths that I've always been obsessed with and always enjoyed the most is the story of the end of the world, the myth of apocalypse. And I just think that is incredibly interesting that we have all these cultures and one of, their, one of the common elements in those cultures is they all assume the world is going to end someday and they all have an opinion on how that's going to happen. My favorite apocalypse, my favorite end of the world is Ragnarok, the end of the world in Norse mythology, in which uh, you know, the, the gods come together one last time to fight one last battle. It's a very Norse thing. It's a very much, it, it, it's not, do not go gentle into that good night. It's, it's brutal and bloody and horrifying and they fight and they die, they all die. And all that's left are two people who have to repopulate the world. And what's interesting to me about Ragnarok as well is that the original Norse conception of it was so brutal and, and so bleak with this little tiny bit of hope maybe at the end that there's a couple of people still alive. But once, uh, once Iceland and the Netherlands and Norway and so on and so forth were Christianized, 
the myth changed a little bit. Ragnarok changed a little bit. Uh, they, they, they sort of added an epilogue to the end of the world uh, in which all the gods are killed. And then coincidentally at that point, the one true God shows up and, uh, and, and rescues the world and creates these two new people who of course we would know as Adam and Eve. And we get the feeling everything is gonna be okay. It's not quite as kind or as comforting in the original Norse conception. Uh, so the Christians added this onto, onto the local myth when they took over. By the way, if you're interested in this sort of thing, and God knows I am because I'm such a geek for it, read Njal Saga, which is the great Icelandic prose epic. If you want to see early Christians in action, it's a, it's a story that tells the Christianization of Iceland by missionaries, and it's just amazing. Basically, the missionaries come in, and if you do not accept Jesus Christ, the Lord of peace, they kill you. And it's a really amazing story. So I encourage you to look at that. But as I've, as I've looked at myth over my life, I've always been interested in how each myth influences the myths that follow it. For example, Paradise Lost, which we would think of as a, a hardcore Christian story. There's no question about it. It's the tale of the fall of man. It's the story of the fall of Satan. It is definitely about Christian mythology and, and Christian thought. But if you read it carefully, you will see echoes of Greek myth. It's just, it's suffused throughout the, the entire poem. There's references to Ovid and references to Apollo. And the layout of paradise and the layout of hell are based on gardens that were in Greek mythology. And it's a really, it's just a really terrific look at how myth propagates myth and myths promote themselves and create themselves. So as I think about the end of the world, I always think to myself, what happens afterward? There was a story when I was a kid that I loved called, What Do You Do on the Day After Doomsday? And I think about that a lot. And a generation ago, if you had asked somebody to describe how the world will end, I'm pretty sure they would have said nuclear war that there would be a thunderclap maybe, there'd be a burst of fire, and then we're all dead. Now, of course, some of you may be old enough to remember, as I do, the, the television show The Day After, which purported to show us what it would be like to live after a nuclear war, and it was pretty brutal and horrifying. But let's face it, that, that show presupposed sort of a limited nuclear exchange. At the height of the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union had the capability to wipe out the planet over 100 times. So what are the odds that the exchange would have been limited? I think we're talking it would have been just one big burst of light and then we're all gone. But today, I think we feel like, feel pretty confident the world isn't likely to end in nuclear fire. There may be some sort of someday, God, I hope not, a terrorist attack with a nuclear weapon, but the odds are the world isn't going to end from a nuclear war. And what I realized were that, was that the odds are the apocalypse is already happening all around us. We tend to think of the apocalypse as the snap of fingers. It's something that happens quickly in an instant. But in reality, it's happening around us already. The world is dying right now. Or if you prefer, it's being murdered very, very slowly. So what happens next? When the apocalypse is slow, you have the chance to watch it happen. You can actually experience it. And that was something that I thought this future world that Rob came to us with this idea of a world racked by environmental havoc and, and mass poverty, I thought to myself, this is the end game of an apocalypse that started before I was born even. And I wanted to reflect that. And I thought it would be interesting. What's it like to live in the last days of the world? And coincidentally, around this time, I read a book by a guy named William Manchester called A World Lit Only by Fire. And it's a historical account of the Dark Ages and how the Dark Ages transmogrified into the Renaissance. And one of the things Manchester says, which I, I suppose I knew on some level, but wasn't really aware of, was that during the Dark Ages, you lived in your village and you were a serf, if you were lucky, and everybody that you knew had always been a serf. And your father and your mother had been serfs and their parents and their parents and their parents going back generations. Because the Dark Ages weren't just, you know, 20 years, 20 bad years in Europe. The Dark Ages lasted generations. And as a result, nobody knew anything but the Dark Ages. And so they couldn't imagine a better world for themselves because they had no example of it in their personal history or in the personal history of anybody that they knew. They couldn't imagine a time when the world was better because nobody knew a time when the world was better. As far as they knew, the world was always like this. And I thought about that and I thought to myself, you know, what if, what if the world became like that again? What if it wasn't just a question of 
gee, things are pretty bad, how can we make them better? What if you couldn't even imagine that it was possible for things to be better? What if all you ever knew was privation and horror and death and destitution, and all your parents knew and all your grandparents knew were the same thing? What would that do to you? And you know, a lot of post-apocalyptic or dystopian fiction sort of has as a trope in it that somehow the characters know the world used to be better. There's always a classroom scene or a scene where somebody reads something or is told something about how, oh, well, you know, there used to be this place called the United States of America, and then there was a war, and then there was this, and now we live this way. So people always had a context for their own, their own reality. And I thought, what if they didn't have that? What would that be like? What would it be like to live in a world where you have no idea? And that is, that is in part, in large part, what came into the writing of After the Red Rain, a world where it's been bad so long, nobody knows what good means anymore. And I just want to say one more thing. I know my time is almost up, but I do want to talk about the other meaning of myth, the one that Victoria alluded to originally, which is the idea that we have now of myth as a lie. And I wanted to play with that too in the book. And so in the book, there's something called the Wikinets, which is a sort of bastardized version of the internet that this world has, where anybody can edit anything at all, including history. And so as a result, no one knows anything because anything that you can look up on a computer, anything you can read anywhere might be true, might not be true. And so as a result, nobody knows. And there's a line in the book where somebody says there is so much information and so little knowledge. And I really felt like even as we head towards our own environmental collapse, the ability of a lie to, as Mark Twain said, run around the world before the truth can get its shoes on has never been greater than today. And so we're also heading towards an apocalypse of knowledge, if you will. And I wanted that reflected in the book as well. So thank you all for listening. Uh, Barry, you said something uh, uh, in your remarks that I have to say, I mean, it, I'm so happy you spoke last because it ties a lot of things together, but here is where my academic background comes, comes to the fore. I want to blow your mind a little bit. <laughs> The apocalypse does not refer to the end of the world. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah. No, but I think our listeners should hear it because I'm always fascinated by this as we talk about myth-making in particular and about knowledge. The end of the world is the eschaton, the last days. Apocalypse is technically a revealing of secrets. So it is when truth will be told and everything that was hidden will be laid bare. So the facts that Kate has been working with and look, thinking about history and how our history is made by ignoring certain facts and bringing others to the fore, the true history will be exposed. And our true relationship to the supernatural is revealed. I think it's fascinating to talk about a slow apocalypse as well and a slow end of the world because perhaps the world is not slowly dying and slowly being murdered. Maybe it's slowly being resurrected and re recreated at the same time. I now have so many uh, uh, things buzzing around in my brain and now all three of our authors are live. So everybody say hi. To oh no. Hello. Um, can, I, what I, I, can, I, can I just break in real quickly? This is Kate. Oh, yes, Kate. I want, yes. I want to make a quick comment. Um, and Barry, I'm not picking on you, I promise. We haven't met yet, and I don't pick on people by um, myself in person. Um, but you know that William Manchester book? Yeah. He's not a medievalist. And medievalist, oh, I know. He, there's been I plenty of. hate that book because it, the Middle Ages was not this like cowering, and sure, there were people who did. But it in itself is a story. There, there, were, there, are, there are plenty of, uh, of, of people who have big problems with that book. I know that for me, it was just the idea of, of, of a situation where, where I, I mean, I feel like most, like I say, most of the dystopian fiction I've read or post-apocalyptic stuff has always had this element of, well, we know it used to be better and let's fight to make it better again. And I wanted something where, what if you, what if you don't know that at all? What, what inspires you? when you can't look to a better day? What makes you struggle and strive? Yeah, and absolutely, and you absolutely sold me on the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I know, like, he's got all sorts of... There's one thing where he talks about one of the popes, for example, um, you know, influencing an artist, and it turns out that pope died, you know, a century before that artist painted. So, yeah, he, there are some big problems with that book. There's no question. <laughs> 
I just want I just wanted to let people know that the yeah. Middle Ages is actually pretty amazing. But but yeah, but no, I, you're absolutely right. I'm really excited to read your book, which I now have. <laughs> now, and how let's talk too. about facts a little bit because uh, one of the questions that we got through the chat function is actually about irrefutable, irrefutable proof. And I hope I said that correctly. Uh, some words escape my tongue. Uh, and this question initially came in for Holly regarding fairy, but you know, uh, the idea is that uh, those of us who believe in fairy are often required to make a leap of faith. How do you think the presence of infallible proof affected the reactions of the people of Fairfold? And if Holly could answer that, but then maybe we could think about the question more widely about fact and proof. Well, um, when, when I was growing up, my mom uh, instilled in me a very, uh, a belief in, in ghosts. She said our house was haunted and she would talk, often talk to the ghost, which she believed lived in the attic. And so I grew up with this idea of the supernatural being very close by, and I was often frightened by it, but I really believed in it. And I had this real crisis of faith at some point, um, which I recognize for most people when they refer to a crisis of faith, they don't usually refer to, um, you know, a believer in ghosts and fairies. But for me, that was my crisis of faith, and, 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 and I did want proof. You know, and one of the things that, that I, and you know, personally interested in is is whether or not there is proof. And uh, you know, so I can easily imagine believing, but I do think that there. I mean, I think there's a real value in in asking whether or not something is true. And um, you know, I would like to believe, but I am now as an adult unwilling to believe. You know, without evidence. I would just add that sometimes, and I'm talking here more specifically about history, um, sometimes people don't want to know. They would rather hold on to uh, the, 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 the stories that they already have in their head because they're more comforting. Um, so it, it's, it's tricky because sometimes it's, sometimes it's ourselves that we have to work hardest. I see that in myself. If there's something I really, really strongly believe how how can I even how can I how can I even know what proof is and where how how what it means if I want to hold on to it that tightly I don't know. Barry, um, you know I'm my my feeling is I'm I'm sort of a hard headed rationalist I mean I I don't believe in any of it, and I think that's what makes it interesting because it you can play with it and it's it, it's an exploration of what if. And I sort of feel like if, if some of these things actually existed, it would be much less fun to write about them because <laughs> then, then, you, then you might as well write nonfiction, which there's nothing wrong with writing nonfiction, but it's not what I do. Um, I, like, I like stuff that is, that is invented and that reveals something about the human character and the human condition uh, based by, you know, based on these things that we invent. You know, there's a reason why we invented vampires and why we invented werewolves. They reflected cultural and personal fears that we had and things we were worried about. And I'm much more interested in that than in if they actually exist. Hilarious coming from someone who until now has been writing realistic fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, and that's why I said at the beginning, it's, it's, if, if you had told me that this would be my career when I was like 15, I would have laughed at you because I would have said, no, I'm gonna write science fiction. And yet I don't. Uh, Audrey Sumzer uh, actually asked the second question that I had set up. Um, this webinar with, and thank you, Audrey, for bringing this question uh, back in. Um, to me, and this is just my thoughts about young adult lit, uh, I think about uh, middle grade literature as a place where the characters realize the world is the shape it's in because, not just because, or, you know, that's not, you know, that's, those aren't just the rules. The world is the way it is because adults have decided that is the shape of the world. And young adult lit, YA lit, is the place where, where teens and char char teen characters learn to make their own choices and learn to recreate the world for themselves. They learn to make their own myths, to pick their own facts, to decide on their own history, and, and to interact in, in their society and culture in their own unique way. So Audrey's question is, young adult literature has come to play a crucial role in the dissemination of myth in the modern age. Why do you think that is? Of course, if you agree with that. I would say yes, but what do you guys think? Well, I mean, I think books play a really crucial role 
in um, us deciding how we want to see the world and what we believe and who we are. I mean, I think, you know, one of the great values of books is that we get to pull on the skin of other people and walk around in them. And, you know, it's shown that reading actually does help us be more empathic. And I think that, you know, with a book, no matter where you live and, you know, no matter what is going on with you, you get to visit um, far flung places and, you know, people completely outside um, your experience, you know, maybe in places that you will never actually get to go to physically. And I think that that is, it has a huge part in us deciding how we want to live and who we want to be. Yeah, I want, I totally agree. I think stories are so incredibly powerful. I think our brains are hardwired to create story going all the way back far, far before the invention of writing anything. I think that's probably one of the first things human beings, I think it's part of what makes us human is that we tell stories. And, and I think in terms of young adult, I think, you know, books, can be, they can be a refuge for a teenager. They can be a place of discovery. They can be a place where they, you know, that we, I, I remember the books, the books that I read as a teen are the ones that kind of hardwired into my brain in a way that books that I love just as much as an adult don't really do in the same way because it's like my brain is was so much more elastic then that, that it actually taught me in some ways the stories I read how I could act and aspire. I think one of the things that bothers me um, about our capacity for story, though, I mean, it's a wonderful thing, obviously, and I have a job because of it, but also it's been proven that this is one reason why it can be very difficult to persuade people when they're wrong about something. And it's one reason why people so easily believe fabrication and conspiracy theories and those sorts of things, because they are, they have the quality of a good story and, and our brains are very receptive to that. And so I do feel to a certain degree that part of what we can do as storytellers, I don't feel like we have to, I don't feel like we have to, uh, again, write nonfiction and just present people with facts, but I think there should be a core of truth to what we put out there to counteract the stories that have a core of falsehood to them. Listening to us all type in our chat to keep uh, track of the questions here. Um, so, uh, Holly, this question comes for you, but it, I think it applies to all of them. I think, Kate, we've already heard how much research you've done on the Ptolemaic era in ancient Egypt, and I think this applies to your other stories as well, particularly the Spirit Walker series. But, uh, Holly, what kind of research have you done for your books on the Fae? Um, well, I think, um, you know, I could name specific books, but one of the things I just want to say about being writers is I think that writers are often people who go read weird stuff that we don't necessarily um, think we're going to use for our books. And often our books come out of the stuff we love rather than, you know, deciding, for instance, that I'm going to write about fairies and so I'm going to go and learn everything that there is about fairies. You know, most, like, I really loved fairy folklore long before I started writing about fairies. Um, you know, I started with probably Brian Fred and Alan Lee's beautiful illustrated book, Fairies, which if you've never seen, I highly recommend. Um, Brian Fred did concept art for um, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Alan Lee did concept art typing. for Typing, I can hear you typing. <laughs> <laughs> Holly, keep going, sorry. <laughs> I, I, you know, from there, I wound up you know, reading a lot of things. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorites is a book called W.Y. from uh, a book by W.Y. Evans Wentz called Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. And um, it's folklorists going out um, and getting stories about real people's um, real experiences, according to them, with fairies. Um, Dermot McManus's The Middle Kingdom is also a favorite. Um, Catherine Briggs has a large body of fantastic work um, uh, researching um, fairies and sort of distilling that information. Um, and then, actually, fairy tales were really hugely influential on me, even though there actually aren't that many fairies in fairy tales, uh, and the colored fairy books in particular. What about you, Barry? What sort of research did you do for After the Red Rain? Oh, thank God people aren't asking me that about killers anymore. 
Um, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, really, it was it was a lot of uh, a lot of sort of environmental research, and and you know, I didn't actually, fortunately or unfortunately, as the case may be, a lot is being written about that right now, and I really felt like just in my day to day watching of the news and browsing of the internet, I was stumbling upon all this information about environmental collapse and and you know overpopulation and all the things that were were going to be important in the book are things that we're talking about right now, things we've been talking about for 30 years and not really doing much about. So I, you know, I, I got lucky with this one. I have to admit, the research came to me. I didn't have to go looking for it. I, I think the detectives at your local precinct are super excited. <laughs> something else. <laughs> I'm friends with the detectives at the local precinct, so I'm good. Yeah, don't mess with Barry, people. This is this is your message. He ha he has friends in in strange places. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. Did any of the authors have a question they wanted to ask each other? Oh, I have a lot of questions, but I don't think enough. <laughs> uh, Eileen, did you want to jump in with a question? Um, thanks. Um, I did have a question, just quickly. When you're in another world so often as you're writing, what do you take away from that world and bring back when you when you come back to reality? Ooh, that's so good. Oh. Other than the fact that you're relieved <laughs> that you can stop writing for a while. I feel like I'm often in a slightly altered state of consciousness when I am in the middle of a book where half of my attention is never really fully not, like not never fully in one place. And um, and it can be a pleasurable feeling and a not pleasurable feeling. Um, you know, I think if things are going well, I, I think it's less that I bring back what's actually going on with the characters and I more bring back whether or not I feel like I'm really moving through the story the way I want to be. But I think a lot of times I have this really sense of split consciousness that when it goes away and when I'm not working on the book anymore, it's also just, like it's also a little unnerving because I'm so used to being there. I have to add, it, I have to totally agree with what Holly said. It, it is often, sometimes my kids when, I, when they were at home would say, Mom, are you here? <laughs> <laughs> I a good question for them to ask, so. <laughs> I, uh, I, I have been accused of having been born without a soul because it just, it doesn't impact me, you know? Um, I can be writing something from the point of view of a serial killer and spend four or five hours living in that guy's brain, and then I step away from the computer and it, it, I'm me again, it's not a problem at all, um, which That's good. probably That's says more good about to know. me than it should. <laughs> yeah. Especially for I don't Barry. know that I get involved with the characters in that much, but I think more like, like as Holly was saying, because I understand that too, Barry, that sense yeah. of being able to, the, my characters aren't me, yeah. but sometimes I'm just so immersed in what I'm doing in the flow and that process of Oh, sure. You can get, you can get sucked oh, in to the yeah. act of writing itself. Sure. Oh, yeah. That God. totally overtakes me. Yeah. And there are times you look up and you realize three hours have gone by and you're like, where the hell did that time go? But I think, I think the experience of writing and reading is very different. Like, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, you talk about like whether whether or not it feels soulless to be able to write about really horrible things, but I think it very it feels very different to read about them. Like, oh, sure. It, it, I think you do take that stuff, you know, it is very affecting when you're actually reading, but writing is just such a different thing. You're constructing it. Like, I think you have a sense of the way in which it is not true. That you right, because, read it. because it, ideally it flows naturally from you, but there's still an artificial construct to it. You know, you're still at some point going, ooh, should there be a paragraph break here? Or wait, does a colon come before or after the close quotation mark? And, <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, that, that, that interrupts that, that sense of I am living in this. Right, we're always engaged. We're, we're always engaged both in being immersed in it, but we're also constructing it. Yeah. So that, is, that in itself is like a split consciousness within a split consciousness, so. A question about that, I mean, you know, the idea of being changed a little bit by what you write or taking away from it, ha have you been surprised by any 
by when you come to the end of writing a book, particularly something very um, psychologically or emotionally intense, is, do you ever have a moment of surprise about what you discovered about yourself from writing that book? I'm a tremendously shallow person. I don't think I've ever discovered anything about myself in writing a book other than that I was able to write that book. I've been surprised by things that happened in the book that I didn't necessarily set up. Like some of my best twists were things that happened like literally, literally in the moment as I came upon them writing. Um, but I don't know if I've been surprised by anything. I think once, once or twice my husband said, you wrote that. <laughs> like, you know, like, do I want to know you? <laughs> but I, don't, I think for myself, but yeah, I would agree with Barry. I don't. I think I once I was trying to, I was trying to, I was putting together a speech at some point and I was starting to think about my books. And one of the things I realized from them is how much I'm interested in people who are caught between two things and are trying to figure out like how to live in two worlds, but I was that that is the only thing that where I was like, oh, that's really odd that I keep doing that. <laughs> well, yeah, I have certain thematic things that pop up in my books over and over again. My mother's an immigrant, and I there's a lot of immigration in my books, so things like that appear. Well, I want to thank you guys. Uh, we're near basically the end of the hour, and I know Barry uh, has to run off to perform some sort of nefarious deed um, with his detective friends. But I want to thank uh, Holly, Kate, and Barry for being with us for this hour and sharing uh, with all of us, uh, you know, where they've been thinking about these things with myth. Um, very quickly, um, Holly, is there going to be another Cold Town book? I would love to do another one. I know what happened. <gasps> ah! oh, so, no. I just want to say, Kate and Barry, I read both of your books on my plane ride home from Seattle yesterday, and they absolutely they were so great. Thank you so much for, for making my plane ride amazing. <laughs> uh, we know that Kate's book, Quarter Fives, is coming up in August, and she'll have another book on the orbit list coming up this fall, and Barry's book, After the Red Rain, comes up in August as well. Thank you all so much. The chat function uh, has the galley to the net galley, the e-galleys that are available uh, on our littlebrownlibrary.com site. So there's, there's a page that has all three of them there. You'll have until March 12th to do the down load. Um, and we will also include that link in the follow-up email we send out to everyone. I think Eileen will join us again for a few wrapping up words, but thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, let me tell you that tomorrow all attendees will receive an email containing a link to today's slide presentation, the list of titles presented, and a link to the certificate of completion. You will also receive a notice when the video archive of today's webinar is posted at booklistonline.com slash webinars. And if you go to that, uh, you will also uh, see the link for the net galleys as you go through uh, today's presentation. Please visit that same URL to learn more about Booklist webinars, view an archive of past webinars, or register for upcoming events such as the one seen here. I'm going to do comics and nonfiction. As a special thank you, today's webinar attendees can get 22 book lists and four book links print issues plus full access to book list online for 20% off the subscription price. This great offer expires on March 7th. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, and one more thank you to our amazing panelists, as well as our sponsor, Little Brown Company Books for Young Readers. This concludes today's webinar.